the Black Lives Matter movement uh, evolved and came, uh, of course, this discussion uh, was uh, loudly, loud and clear. Uh, but this, the book of uh, Susan Neiman, Learning from the Germans, was published in 2019, and she uh, is very positive about German memory culture. But, well, if we see how uh, in, within Germany itself, there is also some criticism on German memory culture. East Germans view Kohl on ice, um, by Helmut Kohl. Uh, a memory culture which does not which does not do justice to their experience of two dictatorships one after the other um, and how should immigrants relate uh, to german memory culture or is german mem memory culture more or less designed to exclude them today historians are convinced it's time for a more critical approach uh, new questions arise such as uh, the how should we see the history of environmental pollution during the Wirtschaftswunder, for example? The place of women in the 1968 movement. Uh, the histories are often very male dominated. Uh, or the importance of neoliberal thought in the reconstruction of East German uh, industry after the fall of the wall. Uh, somewhat more criticism is asked by many. And today we will speak about uh, some of these new views, and particularly the new view of Frank Beetz, which he laid down in his book, Die Republik der Angst, Eine andere Geschichte der Bundesrepublik, published by Rowold in 2019, nominated for the Distinguished Prize of the Leipziger Buchmesse, and uh, a year later published by Oxford University Press in English. The book reads like a long essay on all possible things which could go wrong, but in the end, often still had a good outcome. Um, but I think it's very interesting and very important also uh, in the sense that he discussed the dynamics of fear, anger, hatred, and violence, for example, but also the dialectics of the left-wing and uh, anger, uh, uh, left-wing emotions, uh, angst, the left-wing angst and the right-wing angst. And most important, I think, also the transformation of all these anxieties in interaction with cultural memory, for example, of the Holocaust, uh, politics, but also in, in interaction with science. Uh, and that's, for, of course, for the discussion on climate change, uh, very important. I would all recommend you to buy this book at Ateneum Bookstore. If we were at Spy, uh, Ateneum would have a small table there where you could buy it. Now you can buy it via the internet. Um, also, I'm very delighted that uh, Natalie Schultz and Moritz Fulmer, both teachers at the University of Amsterdam, and Jacob Pekeler of the University of Utrecht and Saarbrücken, uh, are willing to comment uh, the lecture of uh, Frank Wies. Um, we will have a, first a, the lecture of Frank Bies, which la, uh, lasts around 20 minutes. Then we have three comments and a, perhaps also a small discussion. And then you're able to ask questions via the Q&A tab, which is down under uh, your uh, shield. And uh, I hope I can uh, read aloud all your questions. Uh, uh, and we will see how many questions there will be, but uh, I hope to, uh, uh, well, there is a vivid discussion, although it is uh, via Zoom. For now, the floor is open to Frank Wies. We're happy you're there. Yeah, good evening, everybody uh, from Southern California. And uh, thank you to Ido van Hahn and Tanko Jürgens for organizing uh, this event. We had to reschedule it repeatedly because of the pandemic. Um, I'm very sorry that I cannot be there in person. My uh, son is a student in Amsterdam and he tells me that Spui is a really cool venue. So I hope that there'll be some other opportunity for me to actually um, be there, but for now, this is uh, the second best uh, option. Thank you also to Jaco, Natalie, and Moritz for providing comments. I can tell they're already sharpening their knives and uh, 
um, telling me what uh, what I got wrong in my book. So I'm looking forward to their um, comments. And thank you for tuning in tonight and taking time from your busy schedules to listen to my talk and our discussion um, this evening. So um, as Hanko already said, I will mostly draw on my recently published book, um, Republik der Angst, or then in English, German Angst, Fear and Democracy in the Federal Republic um, of uh, Germany. So I will discuss a new vision for the history of post-war Germany. Um, there are, of course, many others, uh, and perhaps we can address some of the other new visions also in the discussion. But uh, it was indeed uh, my perhaps um, ambitious goal with this book to articulate what I call in the subtitle of the German version, an alternative history of the Federal um, Republic. And um, if you, some of you, I think, have read the, the preface introduction to the book, and perhaps you notice that the book actually starts with a word that is prohibited, verboten, in German historiography, and the word is I. So German historiography, especially of the post-war period, always was supposed to be emotionally distant, objective, scientific, academic. Um, and I think the preface already tries to perhaps challenge that to some extent by introducing a more subjective uh, perspective. Um, but I, of course, do hope that the book is not just an exercise in um, self-indulgence. I simply wanted to acknowledge the autobiographical imp impulse behind um, the book. Um, my political socialization took place in the peace movement of the 1980s, which was by far the largest protest movement in the history of the Federal Republic. Um, it was also a movement that was sustained by the experience and even more importantly, the public performance of fear and anxiety. So in part, the book sees to trace the genealogy of the emotional regime in which I participated as a 17 year old at the height of the second cold war in uh, the 1980s. Um, and it also became clear to me that this intense or perhaps even apocalyptic fear that drove this peace movement seemed to stand in a somewhat odd contrast to the narratives of the Federal Republic's history as they began to emerge, especially in the aftermath of German unification. So this was the period when you had the uh, publication of these hefty syntheses of uh, German history. And, uh, um, my, um, the book's historiographical intervention was an attempt to push back against what I saw as the sort of uh, dominant tone of these um, synthesis, which was essentially an emphasis on West German success. And I think for those of you who are not um, historians of post-war Germany, it's perhaps hard to imagine how pervasive this success narrative really was, especially I would argue in German language historiography. I mean, the idea was basically that the history of the Federal Republic was the only success story we have in German history. It was often contrasted to a history, of course, of catastrophic failure leading up to 1945. Um, even the grammatical forms of the dominant paradigms um, sort of reveal the inherent teleology of these narratives. So the dominant paradigms was something like modernization, liberalization, Americanization, westernization. The story of the Federal Republic was the story of a progressive betterment toward a modern, liberal, Americanized Western democracy. And through what I would call a, like an ironic sleight of hand, even the various anti-liberal opposition movements, the 68ers or left-wing terrorism, became part of this success story because it was argued that they inadvertently, against their own intentions, actually promoted the liberalization of the Federal Republic. So one could argue that at the heart of post-war West German history was a rational, often coded as male, historical subject who was capable of functioning as the agent of these learning processes that supposedly underlie the democratization or it was called the civilization 
the re-civilization of post-war Germany. So this um, subject engaged in this sort of unlearning of illiberal and authoritarian habits and under the tutelage of American occupation forces, the learning of democratic values and behaviors. And this reference to the crucial role of the American occupation as a kind of kernel of post-war democracy, I think already points to some of the problems with this narrative. Because the American occupation army that taught you know, democracy to the Germans also happened to be a segregated army. US military, military was actually not desegregated until 1948. And of course, the, the, the legacy of segregation was present much longer. And I think it's sort of interesting that this is actually a fact uh, that the fact that the American occupation army was a segregated army is something that you would be hard pressed to discover in most of the German literature on the occupation. So there are a thousand page tomes on the history of the American occupation that managed to avoid the term segregation completely. But the fact that the US Army was based on white supremacy and anti-blackness makes one wonder what exactly it was that the post-war Germans learned from the occupation period beyond democratic values and practices. Now, much more could be said about the function of the West as a normative ideal in post-war German historiography. I think it was always a very idealist, idealized West that had little to do with what we could call the uh, really existing West. It was also um, a notion of the West that was oddly decoupled um, from more critical approaches as they actually were developed uh, in the UK or in the US, more critical histories actually of the West uh, informed by post-colonial theory or critical race theory. So I think in that respect, um, post-war historiography is actually also sort of behind um, the historiography of other Western countries. But precisely because the male rational subject appeared to be at the heart of historiographical narratives of post-war Germany, moments of intense emotions and fears could only feature as forms of psychopathological disorder in these narratives. So these moments of fears that were often described as neuroticism, as hysteria, as irrationalism. So all terms that came from sort of psychopathology and they're actually, I could give you quotes from um, these, um, these uh, histories that, that make use of these terms in order to describe moments of intense um, fear. And I think the fact that they have to be pathologized uh, indicates that um, a sort of um, insecurity about to how to historicize them properly. Now, it of course would be preposterous on my part to claim that um, these historians who wrote these success narratives got it all wrong and now Bees arrives and uh, you know, tells the correct story. That's not what I would like to argue. I think this historiography actually provided much needed explanations for the traumatic transformations of West German society. I mean, it's important to remember that um, West Germany now, uh, Germany now has a very long history. It's almost as long as the history of uh, Imperial Germany, the Weimar Republic and the Third Reich taken together. And during this period, of course, um, German society changed dramatically, but without the you know, dramatic ruptures and upheavals that um, were so important in previous periods of German history. And I think these um, sort of transformation stories um, were very good in sort of capturing these, uh, this sort of incremental gradual change. But these success histories of the Federal Republic were very much also written with the benefit of hindsight. That is with the knowledge of how things have turned out. And this, of course, was an epistemological position that West German contemporaries did not share. Because their own experience of fascism and genocide of total war and total defeat made them very much doubt the prospects for peace and democracy. And my book really tries to take these contemporary uncertainties and anxieties seriously and turn them into a starting point for an alternative history of the Federal Republic. So in a way, the book tries to give post-war Germans what we all have, 
And that is an open future. We don't know what the future will hold for us. And many German or Germans in the post-war period, of course, didn't know that either. Um, and I think these, um, these sensibilities, these fears and anxieties of post-war Germans have assumed a renewed and perhaps eerie plausibility given the current crisis of liberal democracy. So I think much like post-war Germans, we have a renewed sense today of the fragility and contingency of liberal democracy, of the fact that political developments can turn into very unexpected directions very quickly. And perhaps this awareness is more appropriate in the US than um, in Europe. Uh, it's perhaps important to remember that um, we essentially very narrowly avoided a political catastrophe last November. So if Trump had won 50,000 more votes in the right places, he would now have been, he would have been re-elected. Um, and it's probably true that this book was also written from an American perspective um, in the sense that it was informed by this uh, crisis of democracy during the Trump years. And uh, perhaps I projected some of this sense of crisis also onto my view of the history of the Federal Republic. So the book tells the history of the Federal Republic not so much as a linear story of success, but uh, more cyclical, as a series of cycles or crises of fear and it identifies um, in post-war German history what uh, this historian Reinhard Koselleck has called repetition structures. So certain patterns that keep repeating itself. And you know, if you do that, then it's sort of more difficult to tell a sort of linear upward story. And let me just um, highlight three of these uh, particular repetition structures that I've um, discovered in the history of post-war Germany. The first one is a peculiar discrepancy between the imagined futures and the lived reality of West Germans. So the history of the Federal Republic was also the history of successive catastrophic scenarios of retribution by Jews and enslavement by occupation powers in the early post-war period, of nuclear war during the Cold War, of economic or environmental collapse, of a new authoritarianism, either from the left or from the right. Now, these imagined future scenarios had different temporalities. Some of them appear to be located in the more distant futures. Others seemed more like imminent threats. But as um, the historian Joachim Radkau, he's written a history of uh, the, germ the future in the post-war period. He argued that these future scenarios actually gave West German history a kind of drama and excitement that the actual history of the federal public often lacked. It became kind of predictable, you know, the story of kind of linear progress. Um, moreover, these sort of scenarios also had, had one thing in common, namely that it, they did not become true, at least not in the ways in which they were imagined. But I would argue it was precisely this catastrophic consciousness, this discrepancy between an imagined catastrophic future and a relatively benign present that shaped the horizon of expectation of West German society. The second repetition structure would, structure would be an intensifying dialectics of right and left wing fears, which remain deeply intertwined and mutually reinforced each other. This is, I think, because the Federal Republic lacked a foundational consensus, like perhaps the American or the French Republic. And as a result, the Federal Republic experienced for much of its history, a kind of intellectual civil war. That is both the political left and the political right accused the other side of wanting what was called a different Republic. The philosopher Jürgen Habermas famously stated that it took him until the 1980s to really believe in the irreversibility ir 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 of the Federal Republic's democratization, namely when he realized that the conservative core government did not inaugurate an authoritarian transformation. But I think this anxiety over West German democracy is not very well represented in narratives that tell the story of progressive and rather linear betterment. And finally, a third repetition structure, a dramatization of politics that featured the persistent search for scapegoats, 
Now, as a Rechtsstaat, a state based on the rule of law, the Federal Republic was, of course, very different from the Third Reich. But the practice of creating consensus by ostracizing others, excluding others, radiated into the post-war period and manifested in itself in the construction of a series of others as fear objects. So it starts with displaced persons, with uh, recruiters for the foreign legion who kidnap young German men, with subversive communists, terrorist sympathizers, Turkish guest workers, all the way to today's asylum seekers and Muslim refugees. Now here, I would like to already concede one weakness of my book. It treats these subaltern groups mainly as objects, not as subjects of fear. The subaltern definitely do not speak in my rendition, rendition of the Republic of Fear. And the book really tells the history of what you could call the after effects of the former National Socialist Volksgemeinschaft, the national community of ethnic or racial community of ethnic Germans. There's a story to be told, a book to be written about the fears of the others, about the emotional lives of minority groups. And I think my colleague Benno Gammel has written an example of such a story, a history of the emotional lives of gay men in West Germany. But in this book, I simply lacked the linguistic abilities, the source basis, and perhaps also the conceptual vision to write such a more integrated history. This remains a task for the future, I think. The book also draws on a newly conceptualized history of emotion. Um, fear seemed to be particularly well suited to illustrate post-war Germany's specific temporal structure, namely a future that remained informed, even determined by shifting memories of the past. There is no universally agreed upon definition of fear, but it's clear that it's essentially a future-oriented um, emotion um, we feel something that we do not like to happen, but think is likely to happen in the future. And these fears are often also informed by memories of the past. So the book makes use of the extensive uh, historiography on memory in post-war Germany, but reads memory not primarily as a retroactive category, as a way of making sense of the past, but rather as a prospective category, as well as shaping anticipations of the future. And it's this enduring significance of a catastrophic past that I think gave post-war German fears also their specifically national inflection. So the book also has perhaps a certain retro quality as a rather unapologetic national history. It seeks to show how and why the nation remained a central cate experiential category for post-war Germans and defined the ways in which they, looked at, they located themselves in past, present, and future. Now, there's a very um, popular argument that German nationalism somehow disappeared after 1945, but this actually strikes me as one of the myths of this success na narrative. Um, it's true that the objects of post-war German fears increasingly transcended national boundaries, like environmental fears, uh, for example, um, fears of immigration, but the nation as a central experiential category, category receded into the background only slowly and gradually, and Germans tended to give transnational fears distinctly national inflections. So the book also offers a kind of national history of transnational connectedness. Let me make um, three uh, more brief points about fear in post-war Germany. Um, first, it's important to emphasize fear's political versatility. Fear has been historically associated with authoritarian and totalitarian regimes, but the book also shows the productive function of fear in liberal democracies. Fear sensitized post-war Germans to possible authoritarian challenges, and it served as an important mobilizing factor in the new social movements of the 70s and 80s. Second point uh, concerns the context dependency of fear. So the more I worked on the history of fear, the less I seemed to be able to say anything in general about uh, fear and became convinced that the multiple functions and meanings of fear could only be understood through its various contexts. 
And thirdly, fear was always closely related to other emotions. It's very difficult even for natural scientists to identify the exact difference between, say, fear and anger. There were moments in post-war history when trust or even love contained fear. There were other instances when fear translated into a lingering resentment or more active hate and violence. So the history of fear needs to be integrated into a broader history of post-war emotions. The book is perhaps also somewhat unconventional in that it does not have a stable set of protagonists. What connects the individual case studies of which the book is comprised are the shifting configurations and multiple meanings of fear. And I try to show that emotions and fear are not epiphenomenal, but that they really are causative agents in their own right. So my uh, attempt really is to write a history of emotions with emotions as, uh, as agents, rather than an analysis just of the role of emotions in history, where they would be sort of um, epiphenomenal. Now, as I already said, the book consists of these uh, individual case studies, and these case studies are connected through three larger analytical arcs, and let me just name them here. The first one is a shift from what I would call a repressive to an expressive emotional regime. Um, so emotional regimes are the cultural norms that uh, define the ways in which we experience and express emotions. The second one would be a shift of fear objects from external objects to internal ones. And the third one would be a shift in the political function of fear from the containment of fear from above to the mobilization of fear from below. I don't have time here to fill in the content um, of these um, arcs, um, but I would just like to, to emphasize that the conditions for oppress, expressing emotions, there's the emotional regime actually changed dramatically during the post-war period. And the book actually um, spends quite a lot of effort to explain how and why that happened. Um, also, the objects of fear and the political functions of fears changed uh, dramatically. So the argument is to show that fear actually did have a history in the post-war period and that, um, you know, um, the, this emotional history was um, dynamic and, and changed uh, between the 1940s and the present. The book ends with an analysis of uh, contemporary fears. Um, here too, the nature of fear changed dramatically. Contemporary fears of climate change, of migration, of financial collapse, lack a concrete location. Um, in the case of climate change, it even, uh, they even lack a sort of cataclysmic um, event. Um, these fears are increasingly deterritorialized. Um, um, I think the current moment is defined by a dialectic of competing fears, climate change on the left, immigration on the right. And this, of course, uh, has a longer history in the, the history of the Federal Republic. And I think what, what defines these new populist movements of the right is that they make the indeterminacy of globalized fears more manageable by, by identifying certain fear objects, by protect, projecting these fears on specific groups as uh, scapegoats, Muslims, refugees, increasingly even again, um, Jews. And it's of course at this point that fear turns into hate and violence. So the book also seeks to unearth the emotional basis of right-wing violence in post-war Germany, which was always far more pervasive and lethal than um, left-wing violence. And I think the, um, the relative neglect of the history of right-wing extremism in post-war Germany strikes me as another deficit of uh, these success narratives because that of course was something that was difficult to um, assimilate to this uh, narrative of progressive democratization and liberalization. So let me conclude with one final thought. I do think that the current moment has again highlighted uh, what you could call the productive, even positive function of fear. Um, not only because it inspires a behavior that protects, protects us from a globally circulating virus. And of course, I finished a book before the onset of the pandemic. Uh, 
But like post-war Germans, we have again become more aware of the fact that political catastrophes are possible, that history does not always progress toward a better end, and that democracy and our way of life can collapse relatively quickly. So the fear of losing democracy is perhaps the first step in its more than ever necessary defense. So thank you. With that, I would like to stop and I look forward to the comments. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very broad and intellectual talk. And I'm excited what Natalie Schultz will say in her reaction. Yeah, thank you, Frank. I mean, it's, it's obviously absolutely completely impossible to do justice in five minutes to your work. Uh, and and what you uh, what you said, or maybe what you feared of, you know, critical uh, critical noses was actually my problem because I'm just um, I'm too happy with what I've read, and I in in, in many ways um, sort of identify with the intellectual project. I think that you are that you are giving to us, um, so that makes it hard for me to be to be very critical. Um, but you know, let me just try to to pick on something and and maybe think with what's what's in my head at, at the moment and, and, and related to some questions that, that occur in my, in my own work uh, or some themes. Um, I mean, um, you know, the, the, the book has a twofold project, um, as I understand and as you write it, and, and I would translate it in as writing a history, uh, obviously, of the Federal Republic formed by fully embodied human beings, which means it includes their ideas, their actions, and their emotions obviously focusing on fear here. And, and this is, uh, yeah, this is not as self-evident, even though we have had like, you know, last 10, 15, 20 years, um, you know, very exciting things occurring in emotional history, but especially when it comes to the grand narratives, um, it is not self-evident as, as you have shown, and it's very worthwhile. The, the, the second project is, um, to disrupt, and I quote you from the introduction in English, to disrupt the two teleological and linear histories of the Federal Republic uh, as a success story of modernization, liberalization, and westernization. Uh, and, and maybe first I have to say um, that uh, I, I'm myself always skeptical of grand narratives, um, and in a way you provide one, and in a way you don't, and that makes me actually, <laughs> that, that, that I think convinces me so much because of, uh, not only of the red thread, but also of focusing on these different moments. And, and it's, it's, it's clear that you can't, you know, you can't give the whole view, no narrative can do that. Um, but, but you do it in a way, I think that is very helpful for rethinking um, um, modern history, post-war history and, and, and post-war West German history. Uh, and precisely because of, uh, because of both uh, projects in it. Um, so I think that both are really impor important, um, but I also think it might be worth, uh, worthwhile thinking just a little bit more about the relationship of the two. And obviously you, you do it already. And what I mean is the relationship, not only of these two projects, but especially of this hegemony of what you call, you know, the rational male um, subject, westernization, modernization uh, hegemony, think about that hegemony, what you're writing against, which is worthwhile because it kind of has showed us things. And now we are, I think, a little bit at the limit um, of, of that. And, and we should start seeing those things that we couldn't see with those glasses on um, as you were. But I think it's worthwhile thinking about how that relates actually to, um, to the history of emotions, um, maybe um, um, in, in general. Um, so, when it comes to the first project, um, I was sort of reminded of, you know, already E.P. Thompson in his work was writing against uh, the reductive view of a homo economicus, right? And he tried to bring the English workers of the 18th century back as fully embodied human beings, which also meant taking discourses and moral, their discourses and moral framework seriously that informed their actions and their emotions. Um, so, uh, and it should be self-evident that such a history is especially useful if we want to better understand the social and cultural dynamics of democracies, right, where there is no given authority that uh, kind of, that puts a halt on, on, on certain ideas and action and so on. So we have to do with what we have, which is the multitude of all the different experiences um, and emotions. 
Um, so your book certainly makes a convincing case that the articulation and mobilization of emotions in the political realm is not in itself good or bad for democracies, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's what we have to do with. It's always part of our action. And, and how it works out in the end, uh, as you also just presented, um, depends on the context and the specific narratives. Um, so such a history of political emotions uh, adds in a way to decenter the subject, right? It reminds us uh, of the fact that we cannot always choose what we are passionate about, right? We, we, uh, we can adapt and react to new experiences. Uh, we are the social actors and, and their, respect, uh, their perceptions and take responsibility. Um, so democracy is certainly not the result of any preconceived development and there's no simple model for how to do it right or how to prevent political catastrophe. And this is, I think, a book like yours certainly reminds us of and, and, and that was its aim and I think it works beautifully in a way. Although you still use democratization, but that's maybe not the, the most important question. And I always think, you know, you know what, what does democratization actually mean? But that's a different um, question. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is really useful also because um, models as Walter, you know, belief in models as Walter Benjamin wrote in 1939 produces a view of history that lets us be astonished about the fact that certain things are still possible, you know, and this, you know, well, how can we be astonished that certain things are still possible, somehow we must have overlooked stuff, uh, and that's basically what he says, and such a history I think makes it easier to to not overlook, overlook the complexities of, um, of, you know, of, of culture and of, of human uh, actions and, and, and ethics. Um, but it is precisely the tendency to uh, write these human realities out of many histories um, and especially out of the grand narratives that, that, I, find, that I find interesting. And, and maybe it's gotten less so, but you know, the grand narratives are they are, you know, they have they have trouble catching up in a way. And so, um, so this uh, dominant narrative of the post-war success story of the Federal Republic certainly has a peculiar shape and background. But I would also say um, this emphasis on rational action and mistrust of emotion can be seen in other historiographies too. I I do think it's something that is specific for the views of the post-war period. Right. I mean, if you look to France, you have you have a similar thing, and you also have now uh, people who are who are pushing back at this. And so this is Hanko. Do I still have some minutes? How do I do? A little bit. So let me just uh, make this one point, maybe. Um, so I'm teaching. I've been teaching a course on the concept of the West for some years now, and discussing discussing different texts and I in a way and so if I miss something in this aspect this is because of my you know <laughs> my specific interest but it might be worthwhile thinking about how not only in Germany how the concept of West of Western civilization in the US in the relationship with Europe in European countries actually became strong again I mean it emerged at the beginning of the 20th century in the way that we know it and became especially strong after the Second World War. And I do think it's worthwhile thinking about that idea, the way it was promoted uh, as in itself something that we, you know, might need, we might need emotions to make sense of it, right? Patrick Jackson has pointed to the fact that, you know, the West was always coupled with decline historically. Uh, you know, Spengler and his Untergang des Abendlandes was a reaction to the First World War. Uh, but even earlier, it came on at the first crisis moments of colonialism. So uh, and then let, let me just end with this, uh, you know, small thought, also taking Paul Betts' recent work, right? right? When you say that, that the US was a segregated US, but the Western countries, including France and, and the Netherlands, uh, right, the Western neighbors were, you know, were we colonizing after, shortly after the Second World War? And, and, and I think you've started and, and you are, you know, part of people trying to do this work of understanding what that actually means in terms of the ways that we look at our own uh, history. And so, you know, let me just say, I do think that it's worthwhile thinking about that, con that concept and, and maybe also, you know, the, in addition to nationalism, there must, there is some overlap in self-understanding and what are the effects of that overlap? 
uh, whereas we now know that the West sometimes still resonates with whiteness, right? And what does that mean? And how did that work in the post-war period? Mm. Okay, thank you very much. I would ask Moritz Stolmer to react as well, and I'm very curious. Yes, um, well, thank you, thank you very much, and it's well good to have you here, Frank, or as close as it gets these days. Um, also, I'd like to say that I very much agree with the critical thrust of your work, so I don't like these success stories and arrival narratives either, but I also think you have something very sort of pertinent, sort of positive to offer in your history of fear, which I think is a highly recommendable book. So having said this, I'd like to play devil's advocate a bit because otherwise also in the interest of debate, we'd just be three people sitting here, four people nodding at each other in mutual agreement. So in my starting point that I'd like to argue against a bit is your chapter on the 1970s by the title of Ubiquitous Fear. So and where you foreground the psychotherapy boom, which in a sense brought fears to the fore, uh, terrorism and the reaction to it. And then the subsequent chapter is entitled Apocalyptic Fear on the 1980s. And it's a lot about the environmental and peace movement. So the question I have is what of the West Germans who don't actually fit into this picture of an angst-ridden society? I could think politically of the more centrist social democratic and Christian democratic voters, so people who are neither very clearly on the left nor very clearly on the right. Socially, I could think of unionized workers. It's no question an increasing amount began to fear for their jobs in the 1970s and 1980s. Still, jobs were safer at the time um, and early retirement schemes and so on quite generous, low mid-level civil servants, also female part-time workers, for instance. Culturally, in terms of leisure practice, I can think of you know, West Germans in the 70s and 80s on the beach in Mallorca, in Holland, um, as they like to call the Netherlands in the sports stadium, the sauna. I was thinking of, you know, an unfearful place in the 70s and 80s, the sauna. There's a whole literature of how, you know, displaying your body, especially unclad, um, has, you know, triggers fears. Not so much for millions of West Germans who went to the sauna Landschaften um, as a mushroomed in the 70s and 80s, somewhat to the bewilderment of foreign observers. And, you know, demonstrating behavior that would, you know, get you get you in jail in, in other countries. Um, so these are all groups and that are rather unfashionable. They're not very exciting. They're not great for a historian's career. So you wouldn't advise a junior scholar to write their PhD thesis on these aspects because it's, it's a hard sell. But I think they're very important and numerous. And lastly, I think it's not just to be contrarian. I think it might have repercussions for the very topics that you are interested in. For instance, I was thinking about the fear visions, the fearful visions, the fear rhetoric of the anti-nuclear and peace movements. So of course, granted, no question, these people generally had these fears. They didn't just pretend. I think there's a very strong case to make for that. But I think in part it was also to, or, to in order to motivate the West German mainstream to share their fear. I think it had a strong tone of, you know, we are on the brink of nuclear Armageddon here. And what do people um, do? They watch the Rudi Carell show on a Saturday night. Um, they, they plan their next Mallorca holiday. And in between they vote for Helmut Schmidt or Helmut Kohl um, to, you know, bad alternatives from the vantage point of these movements. Uh, another thing I was thinking about was the neoliberals around 2000, especially, and they had an undertone, um, actually not just an undertone, they often said so quite explicitly. Germans, you know, apparently most of them don't really care about the fact that their country, our country is losing its competitive edge. They're not very fearful, so maybe we have to make them more fearful. Let's, 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 change the system so as people so that people are becoming a little more afraid about losing their jobs about benefit cuts in the event of unemployment makes them fear so much that you know, they would accept a lot of things they didn't previously accept so this is sort of my just point just to play with this republic of fear motive a little bit to say who doesn't be didn't perhaps 
fit into that narrative and what consequences did it have for those who did fit into that narrative. Um, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Jacob Pekel of the Utre University of Utrecht and Saarbrücken. Yes, thank you very much, Hanko, and thank you very much, Frank, for this uh, beautiful book that I, I've, I read with a, a lot of enthusiasm and interest. But uh, <laughs> um, um, just like uh, Moritz, I'd, I'd like to put stress on a, on a few uh, difficult things in the book. So my first intuition, uh, apart from uh, feeling, the, feeling that a book on German angst is probably a very clever book, very well conceived, very creatively researched, and it was. So, so my, my, my compliments about that. And I like the, the angle of the story of emotions uh, as you explained it, also the way you do, do this specifically. I was inspired by it, but I also have the feeling uh, as you also explained to us uh, that it was also very much in reaction to these grand narratives by the whalers and the winklers, etc. So why bother so much about those grand narratives? Because we as, as professional historians, and I think a lot of people out there as well, know that there's all kinds of um, omissions and distortions in these uh, grand narratives. And um, why not just write this uh, this story um, about uh, uh, about fear in the in the Federal Republic and how it uh, created like uh, let's say or how it uh, how it accompanied uh, Germans uh, in this post-war uh, history um, um, on a on a, a more detailed uh, level. You, of course, then through this um, um, lens of fear uh, are able to point out all kinds of difficulties in these grand narratives. For instance, uh, very rightly so on the continuity of right-wing extremism that often falls under the radar or stays under the radar in these. Um, but could you say similar kinds of things uh, about the grand narratives of other countries. Uh, Natalie, I think, already pointed some of these things out with relation to France and the Netherlands. So is that really so specifically German uh, is my question, basically. Second, thing, second intuition was also, and I, 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 I slipped a bit into the persona of, uh, unfortunately, he already passed away, of Martin Brandt, the first director of the Germany Institute. I, I saw Tom Nyos is also somewhere watching, maybe already zoomed out, but hopefully he's still there. And I thought, what would he have said about this book? Isn't there, I think he would have said, a risk of depolitization, his, uh, the, the history of, of, of post-war Germany and the, let's say the, the emergence of a strong and stable democracy there. And don't we need something like that, as Dutch at least, um, to, to feel confident enough about our big neighbor that it would, it would um, remain uh, inter integrated in a larger European framework uh, to, to cooperate with us and, and try us, try and help us to, to, to let's say, also maintain our own uh, democracy. And, uh, um, yeah, that's, th those are my main points. Um, you try to explain, of course, so, so I, I wanted to add one, one point about that. So you try to explain, of course, that in a way, fear can also help us to politicize our citizens. Um, and maybe I'm too much of a rational um, modernist. Uh, certainly, if I would be Martin Brands, I would be somebody like it, because he, he was of of more than a full generation older than I am. So he was basically part of the post-war modernist generation that, that rebuilt the Netherlands. He was a bit too young uh, for that, but at least he, he was very fundamental for intellectual climate in the Netherlands in the late, from the late 60s or, already onwards. Um, so, 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 so I cannot understand what you mean, but I don't really like it in full because I would rather have a positive political agenda uh, 
not build on fear, but maybe Obama-like, but more build on uh, hope. Uh, and then the last final small point, because I really like and find it important what you say about right-wing extremism also nowadays, simply to, to, to know your opinion about it or your, your view on it, how does identity politics and identitarianism fit in this problem that we have nowadays with right-wing extremism and how does the, the fear part <laughs> come in there uh, um, in, your, in your view? Thanks very much again for this uh, this interesting uh, challenge, a chance to, to 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 engage in this kind of discussion on this important topic. So thanks very much. Thanks for the, all three commentators. Frank Bis, you want to react? It's difficult, I think, but perhaps you have two or three points which you want to make. Oh, you have to unmute. Yes. I would need a, a long time to respond to all of these uh, you know, excellent comments and suggestions. And uh, I hope I'll make it to Amsterdam at some point so we can sit down in the evening um, over a beer, a glass of wine and discuss all of these things. So, uh, you know, already my apologies if I can't address all the really interesting points that you've mentioned, but maybe one comment that refers to perhaps all three comments is that um, of course, you know, narratives are heuristic devices. They allow us to see certain things and they obscure other things. And my sense was that the existing narratives, they, they were productive, they allowed us to see some things, but they also you know, were hiding other aspects. And of course, the same is true for my story, right? That it allows, it, it brings into view certain aspects of post-war history, but uh, it doesn't capture other aspects, you know, that Moritz has uh, very rightly pointed out, and I certainly would not want to argue that um, you know all Germans were captured by apocalyptic fears or so. Um, what I'm trying to do is just to sort of bring out uh, aspects of post-war history that other narratives have not captured, and that um, assumed a very important sort of public presence, right? And uh, of course, this was always contested. I mean, you you mentioned more. It's the you know the centrist Democrats. I mean, Helmut Schmidt, of course, was an adherent of the post-war emotional regime. He hated emotions. He hated fear. You know, he he was deeply uncomfortable with all of this. And this, of course, persisted um, as well. It's just that there was this other emotional regime emerging as well that sort of challenged this kind of view. I mean, and that's what I'm trying to say. But it's of course not. The other one didn't didn't go away. Um, let me just maybe make one comment about each of uh, uh, each of you. Um, I um, Natalie, you said one thing that uh, actually made me pause, and it sort of brings out, I think, part of the framework also of this book. You said uh, we cannot choose what we're passionate about. And I think this sort of uh, points to sort of two different frameworks for writing the history of emotions, because one is a sort of more psychoanalytically formed one, you know, the political unconscious. We act in ways that we're not really aware of. The other one, and this is the one that I drew on because it has been more prominent in the recent history of emotions, is this cognitive psychology. It's this idea that there really is no, you know, um, contrast between emotion and reason that they are much more um, deeply intertwined and that actually we can decide what we want to be passionate um, about so that this is also something that's accessible to to cognitive control but I know that this is a, a sort of um, you know ongoing debate and I'm very sympathetic to everything else you said about the European dimension there's this new book now that I haven't read by Tyler Stowell on the history of white freedom you know, the link between whiteness and, and this idea of democracy. I think this is all um, important work that we have to, to somehow um, assimilate. Um, I, um, um, and I think more it's the, to, another thing you said about the sort of strategic use of fear. This is of course also very true. Um, although you also said something, there's this difference between having fear and pretending to be afraid. And that, of course, also points to a sort of key methodological problem of the history of emotions, because we cannot look into, you know, into past historical subjects. We don't know 
what was going on um, within them. But um, you know, here I just follow this idea by William Reddy, who says that you know, the articulation of fear actually is integral to the emotion. So really, we can only study emotions that are articulated in some way. That's why I'm also skeptical about psychoanalysis, because there the idea is you would see something that people actually cannot articulate. And how, how are you going to go about that? Right? Um, and, uh, and then finally, you, I also thought it was interesting that you pointed out the quiz shows as a site of normalcy. But you maybe have seen this documentary on you know, Hans-Joachim Kuhlenkamp and on quiz shows in post-war Germany and how this sort of dark underside of German history was always present there. You know, there's the semblance of normalcy, but underneath it constantly is this uh, sort of lingering presence of the past. You know, the guy who brought Hans-Joachim Kuhlenkampf the, his coat, the butler, he actually used to be in the SS. He was a perpetrator. And there were all these sort of weird jokes about you know, Germans on the Eastern Front and the Second World War. So I find this very fascinating. And I think, Natalie, your article at VW goes in the same direction to sort of show the persistent undercurrent of this kind of lingering fear and anxiety, even when there is a sort of semblance of, uh, of normalcy. Um, and, and finally, um, Yako, why bother about these narratives? Why not just tell the story and, and ignore it? Well, they, you know, uh, um, I mean, on the one hand, they were tremendously influential, not just intellectually, you know, they were funded with huge amounts of money, projects on westernization in Tübingen, which is actually really stunning. I mean, they have this project of westernization and they really managed to completely ignore any sort of critical perspective on the West in this project. And I find that really um, almost unbelievable, but they managed uh, to do that, you know, with, um, I would say, a considerable amount of ignorance. I'm sorry, but I, I find it hard to, to see that uh, differently. And, you know, the, the, the thing with this, of course, is that I think in trying to write this book, I was probably more influenced by these narratives than I would like to admit, because in the end, of course, I also felt compelled to explain the success of the Federal Republic, because it's sort of hard to, you know, not see it as, uh, as something ultimately positive. I just tried to do it differently. I said, it's not because, you know, they all became these committed liberals and, and Democrats. It's also because of the constant fear and uh, anxiety uh, that it actually could go wrong, right? So that this was actually, ironically, something that, uh, contributed to the success um, of um, the Federal Republic. And in terms of your own view of fear, I guess here we'll just uh, have to disagree because I really do think that fear is not inherently bad or good. It really depends on the context. And you know, the anti-nuclear activists who Vela still characterizes as irrational, as sort of crazy, I mean, today their perspective appears like the rational one. Right, because we've uh, abandoned nuclear energy in Germany, and their position is the mainstream. So that just shows that it's all, you know, about um, about the the context. Um, and uh, you know, I, I would have to to ask you more about what you mean by identity politics. I know this is a very you know intense debate in Germany right now, and I would have to think more about how you know this issue of fear um, relates to that. So. So maybe we'll have to postpone that question for hopefully when we get together for uh, for a beer in Amsterdam. So I leave it at that and you know, maybe yes. give some time for the Thank audience to ask questions. Thank you. Yeah, I will collect some questions. Uh, first question I will ask is from Jean-Paul Schietekotte, if I pronounce his name well, Schietekotte, sorry. Uh, his question is about uh, German repetitive fear for Nazism and compared to the fear for Stalinism in Russia. And he sees the, germ the return of the fear for Nazism in Germany as a positive thing. If one uh, looks at Russia, where this discussion seems to be away. And he asked you how we could ensure that this historical consciousness continues to exist in the future in Germany. And then there is a question about critical race theory, but uh, it, did you mention that and could you elaborate on that? And 
I'm not sure if you mentioned it, but the role of race is an interesting issue uh, as well, which could be discussed in this whole uh, question. Um, well, you know, I, I don't, I mean, the, the fact is probably that with the increasing dis dis distance to national socialism, you know, the memory um, probably is at risk of uh, fading. And I think that's probably part of the explanation for the rise of a new right uh, in Germany, that this memory becomes uh, less um, present. But uh, again, you know, I think this, uh, I think this fear of a, a new authoritarianism or return of fascism ultimately was uh, rather productive. And um, I can see why you know, the absence of that fear in, in Russia is a problem. And I also see you know, the absence of that fear in this country here in the US. So you know, that uh, the, the, the threat of fascism is perhaps more present because uh, too few people seem to be worried about it. Um, and I think, I mean, you know, there are different views on this, but I think we narrowly avoided a version of that just recently. So um, I, I just can agree with that observation. And yeah, this issue of race. So um, just in general, I think uh, I, I see this also as a big deficit of the historiography of post-war Germany that uh, it has not really engaged with its category of race. Um, I think there are all kinds of reasons for this. Uh, ironically, we've discussed this just earlier. It's actually the very, I think, prominence also of Holocaust memory that has contributed to this because it has given Germans the sense that you know, we've dealt with the problem of race by confronting the Holocaust, but then race, of course, was always defined as the sort of biological Nazi version of race. And it didn't capture the sort of more colloquial racism, which was then sort of euphemistically described as you know, xenophobia or hostility towards um, um, foreigners, um, which is, I think, a misnomer. And so I think this also strikes me, probably also in comparison with the historiography of other Western countries. I mean, the UK, maybe even in the Netherlands and the US, um, a real um, deficit in the historiography of post-war Germany is the sort of deep engagement with, um, with the history of race and, and racism. I'm not sure if you really answered the question how to ensure this historical consciousness to continue uh, in, in, in this, your... this is This is above my pay grade. If I knew the answer to this, yeah. I probably would uh, earn a lot more money. There are two questions on international relations. One is from Kasper about the fear of the Cold War. And he asked, and I think it's an important question, uh, uh, the, if there was a fear for uh, the, the brother country, the GDR, uh, in, in this uh, period, or perhaps even a sympathy as there was in the Netherlands, uh, where there was a, a, a society for the, the Dutch uh, GDR friendship. Uh, and Ido de Haan, my co-organizer, uh, has a question on the role of fear in international uh, in the international arena, uh, fear of rearmament, for example, or fear of turning away from the West, uh, turning towards a uh, turn towards Russia, or a fear of economic uh, hegemony, uh, uh, which was clear, of course, during the credit crunch. Uh, and Ido asked. How did these fears interact with German fears that they are actually quite scary? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I just want to make clear that I made a deliberate decision not to um, deal with the GDR in this uh, book, even though in general, I'm very much a favor of having a sort of you know, integrated East-West German history. My first book was a comparative history of East and West. But um, for me, it was really important to analyze the role of fear in a you know, liberal democracy, um, not in an authoritarian regime. And I think there, there, may, there, there probably were sort of fears that both German societies obviously share, but I think fear really played a very different role in the context of a communist uh, dictatorship. And you know the GDR then, of course, was also an object of West German emotions, uh, both fear and probably some sort of um, attachment. But this was um, you know beyond the sort of topics that I discussed uh, or that I addressed in the book, and I would have to think um, more about it. Um, the same is true for for Ido's question. I um, 
deliberately focused on you know, German fears, not on fears of the Germans uh, in international relations. I think there is some work on this now. That's obviously a, a very important uh, topic and it intersects probably in a way um, that you know, Germans were also, Westerns were very conscious of their um, image abroad and how to shape that image. And, you know, of course it was always designed to appear non-threatening, you know? I mean, I know Natalie has worked on uh, uh, VW, but, uh, you know, the VW Käfer as the embodiment of a sort of non-threatening German product, you know, this so small Karl that seems very, um, yeah, non non threatening. So perhaps in that sense, it it interacts that there was this deliberate effort also to um, to yeah to to uh, appear in a certain way um, also towards other countries. And then of course there is this concept of German angst, where sort of domestic and international fears intersect. You know that. Um, it's something that um, is projected from abroad onto Germans that they're too fearful, that they're not willing to take on more responsibility in, in international politics. And it, it then is used by conservatives within Germany to you know, critique the peace movement and to critique those who are in favor of a more you know, cautious foreign policy. Yeah. Thank you. There's a question of Esther. Uh, she asked how social changing so, social structures influenced feelings of fear in Germany, and if you could elaborate on the uh, the, the process of individualization, secularization, and globalization, uh, and how that, that does that fit into the narrative of the history of fear? So that's a large question, but I'm interested what you will answer. Um, yeah, I mean, this is, um, you know, the, this is a big part of the book that it tries to describe the sort of cultural change in relations to emotion that by, say, the 1960s, this kind of um, skeptical attitude to emotions uh, changed and there was a sense that, you know, having emotions is actually a good thing and ultimately having and showing fear is a good thing. And this, of course, also was then um, related to you know, new ideas about subjectivity, individu individuality. I mean, Moritz has written about this uh, in, in, in you know, really interesting ways. Um, so I think that there's sort of new ideas about uh, what constitutes a healthy subjectivity that then also includes a sort of uh, expressive emotional subject, right? One that is able to express his or her fears. This then also is linked to new gender ideals. You know, so women all of a sudden become the ideal of this expressive emotionality and men try to adopt this more sort of emotionality that is coded as, as feminine. And you know, then the, the last section of the book, of course, describes what, uh, what happens in the process of globalization that um, this distinction between internal and external fears really makes no sense anymore because the, they, they, you know, collide basically, you know, that uh, something like immigration comes from abroad, but there's also an internal fear object. And that um, in the process of globalization, these fears sort of lose their specific location. You know, it's more difficult to address them because it's not clear where they come from. You know, it's not like a, a nuclear power plant that you can go to and demonstrate to articulate your fear. You wouldn't know where to go to. And, you know, as I then argued, this is, of course, what then, you know, the new right then engages in this operation of identifying fear objects that give concrete uh, objects to these sort of globalized fears. And uh, this then, you know, contributes to the transformation of fear into hatred against, uh, against certain groups. Secularization, that's a difficult one. Um, I think the book probably could have done a better job in dealing with religion and the changing position of the Christian churches and what that, what that does to fears. I mean, I think you know, to some extent, uh, the Christian churches actually take place in this or participate in this um, 
you know, um, emergence of a therapeutic society. And uh, in some contexts, then priests take on the role of a therapist, uh, could become a place where you could, you know, articulate your, your feelings also. But um, I think there's probably more work to be done on this. And this is something that the, the book probably, you know, does not address uh, in a sort of comprehensive fashion, but it's an important question. Joshua asks if the writing, if you wrote this book uh, out of a motivation uh, to discover your own fears, what were they? Well, you know, I started with this autobiographical um, element. Um, I mean, I in, um, no, I mean, I didn't uh, write this book as a sort of exercise in self-discovery. That would be, I mean, I wouldn't. Uh, I, I don't think my own subjectivity would be interesting enough uh, to, to, to do that. Um, but um, yeah, it was inspired by these um, sort of subjective um, experiences. And I thought maybe it's important to signal that, you know, that it's okay to have that sort of, because obviously, you know, I mean, there I, I'm, I'm sort of believe enough in psychoanalysis that we all have these uh, probably somewhat personal motivations for engaging with certain topics if we're aware of them or not. But there was this sort of specific emphasis, I think also among historians of the post-war period to completely deny those personal motivations. Because of course, if you look more closely, they could have also been you know, exculpatory and trying to sort of minimize your own implication in things that you know you were not very proud of then in the post-war period you know think about the you know the debate about uh, you know Vela and his doctor Vater who was a uh, deeply involved in national socialism about Martin Broschat uh, the head of the uh, Institute for Zeitgeschichte and it turns out then his Nazi pen party so I think and there was this sort of deliberate uh, gesture of being objective, rational, distant, right? And of course, this was a way also of then discrediting, um, say, uh, historical writing by uh, Jewish historians, because they were told that they're too emotionally involved in these subjects, right? Whereas, of course, the German perpetrators or the descendants of the perpetrators were not emotionally involved, or so they claimed. Um, and, you know, as Natalie said, uh, maybe it's important for historians to remember that we're embodied subjects, as she said, uh, with, um, with our own emotions. Okay, the, the Q&A is closed uh, because of the time. Uh, there are uh, two questions which I can collect happily. Uh, one of Christian Wicke, um, who, uh, ask you to elaborate on the the, the Sonderweg of fear, if that is uh, an issue, because he says, well, uh, the peace movement wasn't particularly something for Germany alone. We see, of course, a, a, a huge transnational exchange with the Dutch peace peace movement as well, uh, and even with the, with the GDR, uh, uh, I think. Um, and uh, Tamara van Kessel has a funny question, I think, the fact that you are all German scholars uh, living and working abroad, which is not true. Jaco and Hanko are Dutch men, so to speak, living in the Netherlands, but the others are. Uh, uh, and you, uh, uh, you also question more critically uh, the grand narrative. Is this a kind of diasporic, diasporic revisionism? Cool. So um, yes, of course, the, the peace movement was a transnational movement and fear didn't just exist uh, in Germany. I, I would make the case that uh, the specific ways in which it was articulate, articulated then had a sort of distinctly German dimension. For example, you know, this link to Holocaust memory, you know, the idea of a nuclear Holocaust, for example, had a different resonance, of course, in Germany than it did um, in, in other countries. And um, so in some ways, this book against my own kind of theoretical inclination, which is very much in favor of transnational history, I realized that um, I felt that this national dimension was actually rather important uh, in part because of the significance of a, 
of a distinctly national commemorative culture in the post-war period. And the diasporic revisionism, that's a very interesting um, idea. And yeah, there's probably something to be said for it. I mean, I can only speak for myself, but I know that, you know, I've been very much inspired by historians of Germany in this country and by their perspective, you know, Robert Möller, Uta Peuger, Heidi Fehrenbach, Elisabeth Heinemann, not uh, incidentally, many of them women. And uh, I think they had uh, always slightly different perspectives on post-war Germany than some of our, Ger especially older German. I think there's a lot, uh, I mean, I don't want to kind of, uh, you know, stereotype or categorize all German or historians of Germany in Germany. There's a lot, uh, this, I think uh, a lot of it is changing, but I think some of the, the older colleagues um, were probably, I would say biographically invested in this success narrative because it coincided with their own professional successes and therefore maybe more inclined to have a sort of positive view of post-war history or at least uh, exclude some of the sort of more problematic aspects from their own you know, vision of post-war German history. Thank you very much. Astrid Nolte also uh, writes that the documentary on Hans-Joachim Kuhlenkampf, where you spoke about, will be uh, sent uh, in uh, the Hessische Rundfunk on the 26th of April uh, this year. And uh, perhaps you can find the link in the Q&A. I thought it was a uh, very exciting uh, afternoon, a very exciting with, with, with the masterclass, as well as uh, this lecture uh, in which you gave a new vision of German history. And we all could think about other new visions of German history, for example, uh, the history of the environment, of the neoliberal new thought uh, of gender, etc. And uh, so we have a we will have a lot of new histories. We didn't talk that much about uh, the continuity and changes uh, uh, since 1990 or 1989, what you want, uh, which is, of course, also a very important. Uh, uh, topic, but I think we have a lot of food for thought to go home, and home is where we all are now. So uh, thank you all, and I wish you a good evening. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for your questions and comments. Really appreciate it. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>